So uh, this session is titled uh, Marikana and Labor. And that's what is important about that is at the core of Marikana, it emerges as a strike, a labor issue. And that is something which uh, previous panelists already referred to, and it's something we'll be digging into deeper this session. So I'm very pleased this session to have with me uh, Kamalita Naika, who is a lecturer at the UCT History Department. Uh, she wrote an MA, MA on uh, women's organizing in Marikana at Rhodes University, and her PhD research examines uh, migrant labor, and uh, the Platinum Belt is one of the sites which she explores. I've also got Luke Sinwell, who's an associate professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Johannesburg and the coordinator of the Center for Sociological Research and Practice. He's been involved in Marikana solidarity for a long time. I actually met him in Marikana. And he's also the co-author with Sibiwa Mabata, The Spirit of Marikana, a book published, I think, a year after um, the massacre. We also have Trevor Nguane, who I'm sure everyone's familiar with, but he's a longtime socialist activist and he's the director of the Center for Sociological Research and Practice at the University of J Johannesburg. And both of these comrades are, as I mentioned, involved in Marikana Solidarity. Um, so uh, before we get into the panelists, I'm just going to introduce some themes for the discussion, uh, which maybe will help us guide thinking about this. So it's now 10 years after the massacre. And one has to ask, what has changed in the Platinum Belt? What has changed in the... In Marikana, what has changed in terms of the union movement? Uh, which are workers still with AMCU? Are there new unions involved? Are the demands of workers being uh, taken up by the unions? How are bosses responding in a changed political economy? We're in the middle of a commodities boom, which means platinum is profitable again, and there's new owners of the Marikana mine. Uh, what, what has changed in regards to the new ownership? Uh, is there ongoing violence still that are affecting the communities? Uh, then we also have the question of power. Has power been built to exert influence to change in both the site of uh, the shop floor for workers as well as the broader politics of the region and South Africa as a whole? So we're 10 years later and our panelists are going to guide us through this question of um, really examining the changing political economy, labor uh, conditions, Marikana and the Platinum Belt, and bring together this question of power, what has changed, what can we do if the things haven't changed indeed to build the type of movement we want to bring about real change. And I'm going to hand it over first to Kamalita, who will speak for about 15 minutes, and after all our guests' uh, speakers are finished, we will go to some Q&A. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi everyone, Morweni. Um, very good to be here and very good to see the woman of Marikana also here with us today. So, uh, welcome. And uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, two things, and one is about uh, the acquisition of Lawnman by Sibania Stillwater in 2019 and what that means. Um, in terms of the memorialization of Marikana and how Marikana is being remembered there um, and how what corporates uh, do in that space and uh, how they are trying to actually take over how Marikana is going to be remembered there. And then I'm going to speak about uh, what this uh, new corporate image and capitalist image you know, what does it mean for labor? And so what I want to basically speak about today is that, you know, what does labor mean after Marikana? And I think it needs, uh, it is about us going back to basics and to again think about the relationship between capital and labor and uh, trying to get rid of everything between. So, um, so, I'm sure many of you know that Lonman was acquired by Sabania Stillwater in 2019. And what that means is, and what they've been trying to do, and you know, Nadira mentioned earlier that one of the demands, uh, and even the women of Marikana are here with us today, one of their demands has been for this uh, memorial and a space of remembrance. 
And of course, um, you know, one of the things that Sabanya has done is that it's really started to focus on creating distance between itself and Lonman. So what Sibania has started to do is it actually tries to portray uh, Lonman as its ugly big sister. And what it's doing as part of that, it's saying, oh, you know, that's all happened in the past. And Marikana is now over. And let's move on. So I have my laptop here because I want to read, you know, one of the, one of the things that Fritz Euster, who's the Sibania Group Manager of Properties for South Africa, said, you know, previously, and he's speaking about uh, the Marikana Renewal Project, which they announced in 2020. And part of that Marikana Renewal Project actually is about building a memorial park. And they have now uh, invited Reimagine SA, which is headed by Mampele Rampele and a former uh, ESCOM boss. And what they have done is, you know, they've really galvanized and they're using narratives of cooperation and participation and most important, cultural sensitivity. And they're saying that, you know, um, we want to make reparations for Marikana. They're using Reimagine essay to do what they call the Letsema process, which I'll speak about uh, just now. Uh, but it's uh, basically what Yusta was saying, that you know, previously Lonman's proposal was to commercialize uh, the, the mountain, but we just didn't think that's appropriate. We want to co-create the space of memorialization with the families of Marikana, and we're going to do like a amphitheater with indigenous landscaping and a remembrance monument and they are now invited to reimagine essay to um, use, you know, methods of Ubuntu and what is called the Letsema process. They call it like operationalizing traditional ancient African uh, modes of uh, communing and speaking together in non-hierarchical ways between themselves and members of the community, and. You know, what this means and, you know, what I always try to tell my students is that ideas, they do a lot of work, right? They, they do, like, a lot of work. They perform a lot of work. And what this is doing, it's also saying that, you know, here we are so culturally sensitive, but this is precisely what the mine workers were doing on the mountain that day. They were communing by themselves. They were saying, you know, let the bosses come speak to us. So they were saying... You know, we don't want the, the, the unions here. You know, here, let's have this non-hierarchical conversation. And in a sense, they were shocked by that, right? And the narrative in the state and in the media and even from the union itself was that, oh, these guys don't know how collective bargaining works. They're just these, you know, rural traditionists, and that's why they're on the mountain and in these blankets. And, you know, therefore, uh, we can't engage them in this way. So what they're doing is that they're saying, you know, there's some legitimate forms of culture and there are some illegitimate uh, forms of culture. And one is bad for business and democracy and the other one is good for it, you know. So um, what this means is that it's also embedded, you know, if Sibanya takes over this process and if they actually do this, how will Marikana even be memorialized and remembered. And in this Mining Weekly article, which announced this, you know, uh, it's in Mining Weekly said, and they're quoting also from Sabanye, that, you know, this memorial is going to be memor memorializing August 16, 2012, when hundreds of strikers armed with nobkiris, pangas, and guns stormed police lines and was shut down after non-lethal riot control methods failed, right? And, you know, what, what they're doing is even in these reparations, they're basically trying to individualize Marikana. So what they're saying is, you know, uh, we want, we have pledged to do individual counseling, which the women of Snatemba already do counseling in the community, right? They want to give individual people housing uh, promises, right? They want to give a few people postgraduate education for their children, right? They want to 
They're even paying the costs of the Bapoba Mohale traditional authority to win back their royalties from the provincial government. And the people they want to provide houses for are apparently people who've been left out by AMCO. So what this means, of course, is that they're actually positioning uh, themselves as better than the unions, the provincial government. And, uh, you know, anybody else involved in that space, they're individualizing these, uh, the, the idea of reparations. And what this means is that they're also saying, you know, tomorrow things will be better. And that is a way, of course, of just completely deferring what are the collective demands on the ground, what are the present realities, and they actually don't have to engage that. So they are now in the process of just making Marikana seem as this past event that we can just memorialize as something bad Lonmin did, and we can get on with building this so-called, you know, brighter future for a few. And of course, you know, the women of Marikana are here, and they will tell you that, in fact, Sivani is not doing any of this, right? It's actually worse than Lonmin in many ways. Um, so what does this have to do with labor? And um, just tell me how much time I have. Right? You're still good. OK. So you know, what does this have to do with labor is that you know, capital is working all the time. They're working all the time. They're building big narratives. They have big money, and they're not resting. And so one of the questions that has come up, and I think this has come up very much in the last panel and even in the reflections is that, you know, everybody thought that after Marikana there was going to be some kind of renewal. We saw the EFF, we saw uh, AMCU, we saw e, um, SAF too. And then, of course, um, things didn't happen, right, in the ways that we imagined uh, that they would happen. And now, you know, of course we can talk about hope and renewal and maybe that's important, but we also have to think about, you know, what what happened? Why why did that happen? And why is it that you know they all, in a sense, coalesced out of and at least uh, came out of Marikana? Even you know, we many of them claim we were born in Marikana, and yet they actually failed to um, capture and uh, that space, right? Which, in any case, they kind of grew by absorbing the power of independent worker committees or the women's movement but actually couldn't sustain themselves. And I think that it's important we ask um, why. And my work, of course, uh, is on migrancy, and I'm a historian. And part of this work has been trying to think about um, what are some of the narratives of why, of how people have engaged in that space. And part, of the and part of that has been looking at really the history of unionization on minds and the history of our own unions and our own union movements. And actually, how embedded Marikana still is in a discourse about migrancy and about migrants. And this idea uh, is an old idea. It's embedded in a long colonial history of how migrant workers were thought about, and that was um, both in the colonial modern imagination, but also within a kind of white leftist working class space, which is, you know, these workers are neither proletariat nor peasant, they're not really fully urban, they're not fully rural, and you know, how do we kind of deal with that? Uh, and this actually created a lot of um, interventionist ideas of first, we must turn migrant, wor migrant workers into real workers, and then they'll become the real uh, working class. You know, And that has a long uh, history. And what that's meant, of course, is that this has only ever been solved when uh, you know, black and African migrant workers have, and workers in general have formed unions or trade unions. And then when they appear in the trade unions, then we say, you know, they're workers. They, this, is, this is the working class. But then, Outside of that, and we see what happens with popular protests all over the country, uh, outside of that, and we saw what happened at Marikana, the moment you step out of that sanctioned space and the moment you step out of those union spaces, 
then suddenly this idea of the working class is this the real working class comes into question. Um, and so that for me is part of some of the reason why the NUM, the state and the media could all have the same uh, narrative about the workers at Marikana that these are uh, criminals, these are, you know, they taking booty and they and they being violent and et cetera, et cetera. How did they all come to share the same narrative? You know, and this is really the work of these ideas and how they've somehow survived um, for so long. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna end soon, but for me, you know, this that those conversations about, you know, is this organized enough and is this radical enough and is this X, Y, and Z, that has somehow made the conversation very murky um, and has somehow made us not see uh, that the mine workers did constitute themselves as a collective. They had a collective demand that was for a living wage and for 12,500 rand. That is a demand that can be upheld. That is a radical tradition. I don't think it needs anything more than that to be said. And that all of these other things that are kind of trying to, um, as much as you know, it might be, we might think the conversation, um, you know, should be directed towards, you know, what has happened to the unions. And of course, we direct a lot of our conversation and our critique at the government which is necessary and absolutely necessary, but I think that sometimes that has even exceeded how much focus we have on capital, on what they're doing, on how they're reproducing themselves, how they're ensuring these continuities, how they're making sure that these demands cannot be met. And I think that we need to go back to those basic questions of what is the relationship between capital and labor? And we need to focus on how they keep remaking themselves. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna leave it there. Now we're gonna hand things over to Luke. Thank you so much, Ben. So I'll just reiterate what was said in the first panel, which is that 10 years on, there's just been betrayal, no apologies, and most importantly, no one has been held responsible whatsoever for the killing of 34 mine workers on the 16th of August, 2012. And even Sabanya, the women of Marikana can correct me, but Sabanya has done nothing material to drastically improve the lives of the people living in Marikana. And we wear these t-shirts not because we are AMCU per se, but we love AMCU because it took on the demands for which workers had died for on the mountain. And it's not because we, we care about the leadership in particular of AMCU. We love AMCU because they, they died for the amount of 12,500 and AMCU took on that amount. They were born out of the blood of mine workers and a trade union is only as good as the politics that workers impress upon it. The insurgent trade unionism, the, the rank and file do or die spirit that was born on the mountain when workers were shot at with automatic weapons capable of shooting 600 rounds per minute. It was born at that moment on the mountain and then they took it forward. The union through the workers took it forward in a five month strike. Uh, in 2014, uh, but we also know uh, that that AMCU was supercharged by the independent or autonomous workers' committees that were born in the Platinum Belt. In 2012, in the lead up to the unprotected strikes, first at Impala, that Crispin Chinguno has covered in depth in January, February 2012, then at 
at Lonmin in Karee shaft in, before it spread to the other shafts, which were then Eastern and Western. And then we'll hear from one of the Amplatz workers, hopefully today, uh, who, who started the workers committee at Anglo Platinum. So there were unprotected strikes, uh, in the three, what, what were then the three largest platinum mining companies in the world in 2012 that were led and driven by democratic workers committees that supercharged AMCU and the 2014 strike. But AMCU effectively uh, shut down the workers' committees in order to maintain a degree, a, a significant degree of control over the union in a relatively undemocratic manner. Um, so we know that democracy failed. If one of the, if one of the lessons we have is that bourgeois democracy failed the people of Maracana, but as other speakers indicated, they reminded us and they have educated us about an alternative, radical workers' democracy, the idea of a living wage which could be centered not on what management could afford, but on what people need to survive. So the <laughs> um, the mine workers created uh, a new political culture uh, that put profit or what they called workers need before bosses greed. And I want to talk to you about uh, one of the leading mine workers, Tolokele Bele Dlunga, who survived the Maracana massacre but is no longer with us today. May his soul rest in peace. He was amongst the most courageous of the workers, and you can see him there uh, in Miners Shot Down. He's from the Eastern Cape, born in 27 June 1978, and then like so many others, he went to Rustenburg to look for work. He became a rock drill operator in the early 2000s at Western Platinum. And he was one of the independent strike leaders, worker committee leaders, who was on the mountain when police opened and fired. On the 9th of August 2012, many of you will know that there was a mass meeting of rock drill operators, about 3,000 rock drill operators held uh, at the stadium in Maracana. And he helped organize that meeting and bring together the people from Eastern, what was then Eastern, Korea, and Western. So all the rock drill operators came together. And then they decided, we'll march to management. And you can see Bele in some of the footage there in Miner's Shot Down. He says, the management doesn't take us seriously. The blood of a mine worker is the same as the blood of the management official. Then the following day, they marched to their own offices, but the National Union of Mine Workers had not been servicing its members and became too close to management. They, Bele and others, tried to engage the NUM. They became shop stewards in the NUM. They said to the NUM, can you take on the demand of 12,500? When they refused, that's when they held that meeting of 3,000 workers. They marched to Lonmin, and then they still said, one more time, we will go to the people who could lead us. But when they got there, they were shot at. Uh, and they believed uh, that two people had actually died. And this was a turning point because that's when they, they sought refuge at the mountain. And Bele said, we wanted money from our employer, that's all. But instead of them giving us money, they kill us. The government, police, and lawmen transformed a labor dispute into a criminal killing site. 4,000 rounds of live ammo, hundreds of police officers and automatic weapons. But as others have already suggested, the spirit of Maracana rose up. The mine workers did not back down. In the shadows of moonlight, with their colleagues on the ground, not knowing who they would see again, if they were in police custody, they searched 
the hospitals, but they decided that they would intensify the strike on that evening so that by the 17th August, you could still see mine workers uh, below the mountain on strike. And so Americana has come to symbolize the idea of reclaiming what is rightfully ours on the terms of those who have been dispossessed by exploitation. Um, but the violence inflicted onto the people of Maracana did not end there. And uh, Nicholas Rush Smith and I have uh, one of the uh, provocations in Africa is a country called Killing the Collective, which is about the violence in the platinum belt that has taken place 10 years, uh, over the last 10 years since 2012. Uh, we know that uh, when the police held a raid during the strike of 2012, because they continued the strike for more than a, more than a month after they had killed their colleagues, um, the police came there and they shot Paulina Mosutlo with rubber bullets during a raid in Inkaneng. She died. May her soul rest in peace. Our police must stop using rubber bullets to disperse people. We need to demilitarize the police. They used tear gas, which choked women and children in their shacks in September. Children still die of electricity connections in Maracana and elsewhere in the country. Lonmin, now Sibanye, and the government provide electricity to take resource profits from the earth, but not to give to the people who need it to survive. On 25 October 2012, five policemen stormed into Bele's one-room shack in Maracana after the strike. They suffocated him with a plastic bag around his head and tortured him in the police station. For three days, he didn't eat. He told us later, we live in fear. We don't know who to trust. Our own union, NUM, turned against us. When you walk down the street, you must look over your shoulder because you never know when your enemy can strike. Bele became an AMCU shop steward. That was the union of the people at the time. And he was a leader of the longest strike, that five month strike in 2014. This strike officially began in January 2014, but he said it truly started when the police killed our brothers on 16 August 2012. With the no work, no pay policy, on the brink, barely sub surviving, Bele and tens of thousands of others said, rather we starve as the unemployed than starve at work, which resonates with the Gauteng shutdown on Wednesday, 24 August 2022, where we say, don't moan, don't moan, organize or starve. On the night of 17 October 2017, Bele was shot in his shack in Nkanang and didn't survive. At least six AMCU members were killed that year, and Bele is amongst at least 22 assassinations of mine worker leaders in the Platinum Belt since 2012. And then as recently as 2022, one Noomsa shop steward was gunned down by two people at his home in Rustenburg. And then who killed him is not clear, but the shooting immediately followed strike action of 4,000 contract workers who downed tools over a wage dispute with Impala Platinum where the contract workers were still making only 5,000 rands per month reportedly. And then there are conflicting explanations of these killings. Unlike the 16th of August, 2012, we know who did it. The 16th August, 2012, we know the police did it. We know the government did it. We know it was lawnmen. But these killings, we don't know what happens. Sometimes we find the puppet who pulled the trigger, but never those who pull the strings. What we know is that state violence and murders are taking some of our most talented organizers. Ntombi Fikile Mtetwa, May her soul rest in peace. Another one of the women who maybe would be with us today uh, was killed in a botched murder recently in June 2012. 
We must see to it that those slain on 16 August 2012 do not die in vain. And our memorialization of Marikana must be kept alive and should center around the role of ordinary people fighting for their rights and what they can do to change society on their own. The slain of Marikana dreamed of a better life and stood, for, stood up for a dignified future for our children. One of the activists who spent so much time in the Platinum Mine Workers Movement said, we were brought here by the blood of the workers, so that blood needs to be taken care of. They can take the lives of our people, but the spirit of Marikana lives on today, now in you. Long live the spirit of Marikana. Long live the spirit of Mambush. Thank you, Luke. Now we're going to hand it over to Trevor. Comrades. <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. Manjere umabela apa entabeni eh, abasebenzi baningi abe kumbula umzabalazo wa mampondo ngo 1960 nango 61 the mpondo rebellion nangitu wabo ya yeah. but hai kungano sife kuno guti sikubege sikashazwa yila belungu bagwa lonmin weabona mao kuluma nenzizo wakazulu umage yati ngono ngife hai pelile Manjege emlando enu e chubago e chu. Mwaba pela i colonialism is treta manda. Is treta nogu i temba. Kuyafne su upege umlando e chu. Si tobe loko ogu sniga manda. Uye si ngobe lempi yama capital. Anit? Yeah. So comrades, uh, I just thought uh, today, because they are put, I don't know uh, whether this is the right king. You know. <laughs> Actually, no one knows. Yeah, the king doesn't know too. <laughs> yeah, so I thought let me start uh, by reminding comrades that uh, uh, those workers on the mountain, they were drawing from a long history of heroism and resistance against oppression, against colonialism. And then there's a spirit where the people say, especially warriors, it is better to die than to betray my cause, to betray my people. Remember, comrades, after 34 mine workers were shot dead, as the, comrade, uh, the panel before mentioned, they continued with their struggle. They continued with their strike. So my point is that colonialism, it does what we can say, a cleanup of our history, a cleanup of our uh, past uh, and then introduces ideas which keep us weak, which keep us easy to control, which make us lose the vision that things can be different. But those miners uh, on that mountain, you, they drew from their past the history of bravery, the history of fighting back, the history of do or die, it is better to die than be paid starvation wages. It is better to die than that my children and my children's children should be exploited by lawnmen, by Sibanye, by Anglo-American, by all these capitalist bosses. So just today I've got so much time, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, let me go to my notes. Yeah, comrade, so uh, those uh, workers on the mountain, they made history. And then they made history with their blood. 
They made history with their bravery. They made history with their strike. They made history with the demands they made. Now, their blood showed that the bosses, the capitalist bosses, the bourgeoisie, they are ready to spill blood in defense of their profits. It showed us that capitalism, I think there was a comrade here, the poet, who said, capitalism is inherently violent. It's a violent system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in South Africa, in particular, it is racial capitalism. So apartheid was a form of capitalism based on racism. Yeah. But we also know that a major element of apartheid, of capitalism, is gender oppression. So you have racial, gendered capitalism. That is what we are fighting. The last thing, because this part is going to kill all of us, bourgeois and, and proletariat, this capitalism is ecologically destructive. So we are fighting racial, uh, gendered, uh, ecologically destructive capitalism. Now, to come back to racial capitalism, it's clear what happened in South Africa. Think of the USA. That economy was built on slavery. Yeah. That economy was built on genocide because what they did with the Native Americans, they wiped them out. They killed them. Remember John Wayne killing the Red Indians? That is the Wild West. Let's hunt. They tried it here in South Africa. They killed the son, a uh, so-called Bushman. Yeah, because that was the first uh, response uh, of uh, mercantile capitalism. Those workers, they continued with their strike after 34 of them died. They said, our comrades have died. They must not die in vain. We must continue with the struggle. Okay? And they said, it is better to die than continue with starvation wages. It is better to die than continue with the migrant labor system, with oppression and exploitation. Their demand was 12,500. The bosses said, what? So much money. We cannot afford it. Okay? I heard some labor experts saying, oh, this is too much. Certainly, the union, the National Union of Mine Workers said, this is unrealistic. The bosses will never afford this. The workers said, well, the bosses cannot afford 12,500. We also cannot afford to live without 12,500, okay? Now, they said, if not getting 12,500 means the mine must shut down, then shut down the mine, because we'll never continue without having our needs met. So, comrades, this is a lesson. This is what we call drawing the class line. Now, some people believe that there can be peace between the jockey and the horse. So the rider is sitting on top, and he says, ah, Jose, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> but who is doing all the running? The horse. Yeah. So some unionists even, you know, let alone Ramaphosa and them who have crossed the line, some unionists believe that there can be a win-win solution between workers and uh, their bosses. Yeah, but I think uh, the police automatic fire showed that there is no win-win game under capitalism. It's a zero-sum game. What is worse is not a game. It's a life and death strategy. So, comrades, uh, it's very important. I'm just uh, latching on on what Comrade Luke was saying about unions. So, in South Africa... In many parts of the world, you get business unionism. You get this idea that somehow there can be a world where workers can have a secure life whilst capital is making profits. That is not possible. Can you see? Yeah. So the spirit of Marikana 
is the spirit of do or die, the spirit of throwing the class line. Uh, my last point, if I still have time. I've got time, good. Yeah, thanks, Ben. <laughs> Mark said, uh, the proletariat, Karl Marx said, the proletariat, the working class, is the revolutionary subject. What he meant was that workers are the people who can change history, uh, defeat the bosses, and create a better world, a better society. Okay? So just before Marikana, there were many ideas, especially in universities, which denied this. So the workers of Marikana reminded us where the power lies to change society. It lies with the working class. Now, Marx said, if you are a worker, without doing anything, in you, that power, it lies there because you are a worker, because of your experience. Let's take the issue of George Floyd. George Floyd was a regular guy, I don't know, where in Michigan or wherever he was, you know. He went there to buy uh, maybe some cigarettes, can you see? And then he got strangled to death. He was no hero. He was just a regular guy. But what was he? He was an ordinary worker. Can you see? And then in dying, in dying, he made history. Those workers on that mountain, when they died, they made history. They inspired millions and millions with the spirit of Marikana. But my point is that when Marx says the working class is the revolutionary subject, what he's talking about is that there is something you can call the organic capacity of the workers to confront, fight with, and defeat capitalism. Because I heard Comrade Shaira lamenting, you know, uh, the student movement, uh, we, we lost, uh, there's something which went wrong. Yes, what went wrong is that there was not enough mobilization of the one class which has the power to win the battle against capitalism. That they needed that, yeah. Of course, it's not the students' fault. Maybe the unions were busy collaborating. Maybe the unions were busy with their internal power struggles, but they needed that power. So good people, workers in South Africa, workers everywhere, they have to realize their power. We have to link up with that power. The middle class, the left-wingers, the socialist group, they have to orientate themselves to that power, develop it, develop the confidence of the workers, and then we push forward behind a vision of a different society. We can draw from our history, we can draw from our struggles uh, against uh, colonialism, draw from all the struggles, but there is no way forward as long as the bosses control the world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you all. Uh, before we go to the floor, I have a few comments and questions for our panel. Um, following uh, Trevor's uh, call for um, workers to unite and building power, I think something that we can take away from Marikana and something we can link to this wider issue of corruption in South Africa and this question of state incapacity, the state taking money from the poor, from the working class uh, for, for government officials and not delivering services. Um, one of the things that we can say is one of the reasons that all of these trials, these legal performances, including the Farnham Commission, failed to deliver justice or it fails to change this fundamental situation in which you see a uh, ruling class enriching itself at the expense of the majority is that the power of the working class is not used to discipline these officials. And in Marikana, what you saw once the workers continued on the strike is that the complicity of the state with capital was revealed for all to see. And this is something in terms of lessons of mobilization we can take going forward. And it's not just for the issues of the shop floor, it's for wider political issues such as corruption, such as the problem of basic services and other things. The second thing, uh, which is from something Luke pointed out, that this violence on the Platinum Belt has continued. We have dozens of people who have been killed. We have no answers to who killed them or why they were killed. We, I mean, official answers 
I'm assuming some people have ideas, including uh, leaders of the strike who were shot down watching football in a tavern. Uh, we have people that I interviewed back in the day who have been murdered. We have to ask this question. It's not just the police killing people. There's something else happening. And this is this eco economy, this new political economy of mafia and hitmen, which is all over South Africa. We can go from the construction forums in KZN, the violence last year in July, to the gangs in Cape Town. There is this collaboration between illicit capitalists and illicit capitalists, the official bosses in which they're using hitmen from the taxi industry and elsewhere to suppress workers' struggles and activists. So when we see leaders of Abashali killed, when we see this, they are hitmen who are part of a broader political economy who are being used. And we have to ask this question, what is the threat of this privatized violence to workers and to activists in South Africa? The third thing, and I would really appreciate if we could get some comments from people who know better than I, who have been there more recently and have been more involved, what is the current situation in terms of the union movement in Marikana? So from what I understand, there's three unions may operating, particularly in the platinum sector, which are the NUM, who is still there, it's NUMSA, who is a relatively new player, and there is AMCU. Is there tension between the unions? How effective has AMCU been at delivering workers' demands? For those of us who are not there, we don't get reporting. We don't get information about it. The news doesn't tell us what's happening. We have to rely on WhatsApp groups to work out what's going on. And this is something if those in the audience could also contribute to, to help us understand something that the media is not telling us. And then the final point I'm going to make is related to Sabanya. And I would also appreciate some comments here, particularly from Kamalita, in that right now we're living through, as I mentioned before, a commodities boom, which means the profits for the platinum sector are high. This is a profitable mine. The boss made a hundred million last year. And that's Meanwhile, are the workers getting more share of the money? I don't think so. What else happens during a commodity boom? The prices, including with, for other reasons, of basic goods are going up. We're living through a cost of living. This is why there's a shutdown next week. This is why work is demanding more. Inflation is reaching double-digit levels all over the world. Now, what does that mean for mobilization right now? This is just, it goes beyond just shop floor organizing for better wages, but this question, will capital and the state stop the cost of living from affecting everyone? Even the middle class, even those better off are being squeezed right now. And this is a social issue that is going away no time soon. Any, anytime soon. So with that, I'm going to hand it over back to our panel, and if anyone wants to start, maybe we can just go Kamalita, Luke, Trevor, and then we're going to go to the floor. Okay, thanks, Ben. I don't know if I... Uh I don't know if there was a question. Uh, like your question, question is it. basically in terms of the relationship between Sabanye, in terms of its profitability right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, I, and I think, yeah, I think you already mentioned it. And, and I think even touching what is so important about what you said and something that has been coming up constantly as well is that, you know, and this is kind of what I was trying to point to, and maybe it's all kind of related, is that, you know, yes, you have now. NUMSA AMCO uh, NUM, but you know, many people are saying, but they're actually competing over the same pool of workers. Like they haven't, you know, what is union strategy around things like outsourcing, uh, around, you know, uh, other contract workers and, you know, many of the, you know, one of the biggest kind of things which actually NUMSA used to say, but now, you know, the other people are accusing them of doing it is, Oh, you know, other unions are coming and organizing workers through the back door. But, you know, what that points us to is that there's something that needs to be asked of this, like, union form. Because what, you know, the bosses are doing is that they're just casualizing and outsourcing more workers. And then that's the, that's the way. And exactly, making super profits. So how are, how do we respond to those things because yes it is a boom and yet nobody is seeing that and i don't know it's not like i have a answer to your question i'm just kind of agreeing with what you're saying and this goes back to this is how capital is evolving this is what they're doing and where you know what is the union movement you know are they are they willing to reconsider the form and the practice under which they are uh, operating um, and, you know, this seems to be pretty, pretty important right now. Uh, thank you. We can go to Luke next. Um, thank you. Um, 
So it's, it's a bit difficult. Maybe I'm not the most uh, qualified to talk about uh, the relationship between AMCU, NUM, and NUMSA, uh, except to say that uh, NUMSA has made uh, traction, especially at Impala, with contract workers. And they have also been targeted um, by by hitmen as well. Uh, those are specific leaders who, so we don't know exactly what is happening, except that those leaders are being targeted. It could be, sometimes we think it's intra-union rivalry, inter-union rivalry, other times we think it's the company uh, or some combination of that because they're challenging um, the the underpayment of such a huge number of, of contract workers at Impala, and then they've killed um, at least two shop stewards over the last two years um, at Impala as they were in the process of organizing workers. And then just in terms of um, AMCU, um, well, I think others maybe who are at the commemoration uh, might comment as well, um, but I know Nick was telling me that uh, the numbers, you know, are increased, are dwindling. There's not the same level of like force and punch. A lot of time has passed. the The spirit of Americana that was born in 2012 carried forth very strongly into 2014. That was the pinnacle of resistance that represented the do or die approach. We will not retreat. But then after that. You know, there's been less support, uh, more infighting within the, the trade union. But I think most importantly, the, the organic intellectuals, the, the force behind the democratic workers' committees have been long ago ostracized, which means that AMCU is a shell of its former self that does not sufficiently represent uh, the rank and file mine workers. Uh, but I hope when Comrade Makanya comes here, uh, and Mzokolo as well from Sebanya, and Amplatz, that they can give us uh, further insight into that. Handing over to Trevor before we go to the floor. Okay. Um, well, firstly, you know, um, Antonio Gramsci, that's why I like uh, to develop this concept of racial capitalism, because within it, you know, the violence is written you know, the injustice. So Gramsci said, you know, a bourgeois rule is based, or any rule for that matter, class rule, is based on consent, agreement, and force. So, you know, you agree, so there's propaganda to get you to agree, and then if you don't, the force is ready to come out. So it's the same with... Uh, legal and illegal methods of capitalists to make money, yeah. So on the one hand, they'll take you to court. On the other hand, they'll, they'll send assassins to kill you, yeah. So this actually, in the academic sphere, created a little debate, you know. I think uh, comrade Patrick Bond is here. You know, uh, David Harvey talking about accumulation by dispossession and primitive accumulation. So that's the idea that in the past, capitalism used to use force, genocide, you know, to get its way. But now it's no longer using that. So people like David Harvey says, ah, but sometimes when it needs to, it does. Can you see? But it's not really a question of primitive accumulation or by... It's just the nature of capitalism that it uses force, you know. There are many forms of force. At work, the supervisor tells you, you are late. You know, is is imposing their power on you. Can you see? And the force is that if you lose your job, you're going to starve, especially here in South Africa. So so that's my answer to that. When it Okay, Luke has covered the unions. Now, Marikana, when we say those workers made history, after Marikana, 
we had the so-called NUMSA moment when the workers in NUMSA said to Ivan Jim and the leaders, let us part ways from the ANC. We can no longer vote for the ANC. We can no longer be part of the ANC Communist Party Alliance. So we're all excited, you know, the NUMSA moment. But we know now, you know, the leaders of NUMSA destroyed the NUMSA moment themselves. We can see today, you know, going to court. So the workers, that is the organic capacity of the workers. The workers at Marikana, they opened doors. Even Julius Malema, he formed his economic freedom fighters on that mountain. He launched it there. Now, where Julius wants to take the FF, it's up to him. Where Numsa wants to take the Numsa moment, it's up to him, to, to them, Jim and them. So I think that, uh, you know, uh, workers often open doors, and then it's up to us, it's up to our organizations, which direction, where we develop it. And I'm, at the moment, you know, we're not developing towards the right way. So my last point, which is uh, most important for me, so we've had the Occupy movement in the U.S., you know, uh, in that park, uh, starting with a Z, I can't remember, uh, Arab Spring, Egypt, uh, Tunisia. Now I've heard that uh, Black Lives Matter, some comrades are calling it the, the Black Spring. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. And then, so, so here is the issue. When workers, like in Egypt, they topple Mubarak, okay, now, after toppling Mubarak, they go home and wait for, you know, free and, free and fair elections. Yeah, yeah. But in, during the Russian Revolution, when the workers stormed the Winter Palace, they didn't go home. They went home to create, to their Soviets, to create an alternative power. So I think it's, the time has come now in South Africa that after toy toying, we don't just go home and wait for the ANC or the DA to deliver. We have to form alternative organs of working class power on the ground in preparation for a different kind of government, a workers' government, a socialist government. So after the toy toy, don't go home and wait for delivery. Build structures so that tomorrow we can uh, topple the, the, the government of the bourgeoisie and replace it. And we need structures, you know, committees, I'm a committee to, 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 to replace uh, the, that structure. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, on that note, we can go to the floor now. I'm going to take three questions at a time. If you have a question for a specific uh, panelist, just mention them. And also, please introduce yourself when you're speaking. So we've got one, two, uh, three. So I'm just going to take. Uh, you two, and then uh, back over there, and then we'll go for the next round. Yeah, I mean, just briefly, firstly, what's happening on the um, platinum belt? We now know that, you know, platinum is under uh, $1,000 per ounce. Um, it's it's figures that force lawmen to sell, but Sabanya is making hands, uh, you know, making huge profits at that level of price of platinum. I mean, the Sabanya boss, Neil Fronman, earns two thousand rand per minute, three hundred and sixty million rand per year, and he justifies this, while rock drillers still earn 13,500. The, just a bit on the Amku Num and Numsa. I mean, when uh, Luke, just to spell it out a bit more clearly, and it's, it's a bit hard to go into details when there's cameras, uh, rolling here, and it's being streamed. But the when we say intra-union violence, we're talking violence between unions. 
uh, and then inter-union violence, union violence within the union. Now we know this has been happening, particularly in the post maricana moment, retaliation, but also the way the whole uh, industrial relations set up around the mine where the office bearers uh, get huge perks, housing allowance, cars, security guards, uh, uh, drinking expense allowances, and uh, are paid, you know, often at the level of senior managers. And when they get national office posts, the uh, executive management uh, levels of earning. So when in 2012, when Franz Beleni is complaining about his 100,000 rand per month salary, He's complaining because his chairperson, uh, who was a minor, uh, was earning 170,000 rand per month and he's paid by the mine. What's happening with the unionization on the platinum belt? Amplats. We now know Amplats, uh, in 20, at the end of 2012, AMCU had 91% of the workers, um, now, today, it's 65%, a huge reduction. And workers are not going to other unions. They're simply not joining the union. The finally, yeah, I'm wrap, wrapping it up. Uh, AMCU president has announced unity talks with NUM, which speaks to both unions becoming very much the same thing. And then, when Trevor talks about which direction, I think we've got to talk, you know, these were moments. Black, Live La Black Lives Matter was unfortunately a moment. The, the Marikana thing was a moment. 47 unofficial strikes, millions of workers out on strike following the massacre and so on. Fees must fall was a moment. The, the only way we can turn these moments into a movement is if we start seriously talking about a workers' party. And we know that's not, from recent history, that's not going to come from the trade union bureaucrats, certainly the likes of what we considered the most radical trade union, the National Union of Mine Workers, or its federation, SAFTU. We've got to do that ourselves, comrades. Uh, thank you. Um, um, I felt like I should greet you with my language, Chivenda. <laughs> um, it could be a question or a comment. Yeah. Uh, for how long are we supposed to be singing this song? Um, for how long? Even our future generation, is it supposed to be Sienzin Na? For how long are we supposed to be watching our fathers, our mothers dying in strikes? Even us, our, our youth are dying because of these strikes, trying to, to take out our voices for fighting for something that is rightfully ours. So for how long are we supposed to be singing that song of Zenzenina? What I can say in English, I don't know. In, in what do you call this? Abasneng. In English, I don't know. Is what what do they call it? Abasneng. Abasneng. Yeah, they don't beg us. The reason maybe I'm not saying it's like that. The reason maybe that they are busy killing us is because of they know that they have backup. They know that. If they cannot hire a South African, they know that they have an illegal immigrant that they're going to hire, who's going to say yes to the little amount that they will get. Because they cannot say no because of they don't have a right to be here. So me, as a South African, who has a right to be here? I cannot say anything. I don't have rights. My rights are just in a piece of paper. They're not exercised. Yeah, we can't even express ourselves. Thank you. We can't even express ourselves. So I think the more we continue doing this, the more they'll end up hearing us. The more we continue having this organization to set things right, they'll end up hearing us. For our future generation not to not have a voice, because the way things are going, our future generation are not going to have a voice. 
That's the way I see it. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question for you, my lady. What is the role of the royal house in terms of helping the widows, their children, and the community of Inkani? That's the only question that I have. Thank you. Um, I'm just, before I just hand it over to our panel, um, I had a couple hands that I saw from the last round. So I had one over here, and then I've got you two over there, and then um, I'll come back just... Put your hands back up when we finish with this, and I'll come back to you with the mic after this round of comments. But I think we have time for one more round of questions before uh, we wrap up at three and have some tea. I'm handing over to Kamalita. If, uh, if, um, there's, I think we could just do one round and go to them after this. Okay, um, so uh, questions. We've got, let's, just go to, let's just do this round of questions now. So uh, you, and there was someone else over here. Uh, it's behind you. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bigom an artist again. Have comrades given thought to the possibility that the idea of a political party itself is a problem? Uh, because a political party by nature is hierarchical. Uh, workers are given power to representatives, and that model throughout history has proven, you know, to uh, uh, to be a failure. It will be problematic. Number one. Number two. Comrades are also seem to to orient themselves towards seizing state power. Our comrades not imagining a stateless society, an egalitarian society. A society where people rule themselves and are not ruled by government. Thank you. Uh, I have. Um, I remember your hand from the last round, so it's right just in time. Uh, thank you, comrades. In terms of uh, the unions, uh, when Sibanye came, it terminated a lot of people's contracts. So I just wanted to maybe know that could that not be a strategy maybe to take power away from the uh, ruling uh, union. Thank you. Okay, and then we had uh, one more question over there. Um, okay, maybe you've got time for two. Good, uh, good. Uh, then you. Thanks. Uh, greetings, everyone. And, and again, we are still in Agas. It's Women's Month. Happy Women's Month. Uh, my name is Alfred. I'm from Tembelise. Uh, uh, I really like the, the presentation from the panelist, but uh, I heard Mr. Trevor engaging more on, on, on structures, uh, community structures. So my question on that was, uh, is that which better way can we uh, form effective structures which will respond to this brutality, oppression, capitalist state in South Africa, South Africa indeed. Then the second one is that um, one of the, uh, the tools you need to focus on uh, as a strategy or solution is that we, we have policies that guide us, guide all these departments. So uh, as civic event, uh, seventh, uh, we need to be part of, of these policy reviews. Uh, so as panelists, uh, can uh, you assist us or maybe create a, a, a communication channel so that we can also be part of this policy re review uh, and participate in, in them as well. Then uh, another thing does, uh, it's just a, a, a solution to this. We, we, we are under a democratic state. Uh, we all know that. And, and currently, uh, the ruling party has failed us, has failed South Africa, has failed youth, has failed women and children. And we currently, we are facing uh, brutal violence. Tembelitli was uh, over the news in the entire country not so long ago, and, and, and it just went silent again. So we need a, a, a civic civil and political structure which will vote us this, this ruling government and, and, and rule the country. Uh, and, and thanks, thanks, let me hold it right there. I see you are. 
<laughs> yeah, so a um, final thing, and we can hand to the panel for uh, just to wrap everything up. Uh, sure, so um, it's maybe more of a comment, but I would like to hear what the panel says about it. So just um, on the, the issue of immigrants being ready to take a job for less, I think, I, I think we've got to realize long before an immigrant is there, there's an unemployed South African ready to take the job, and that's one of the things that's keeping uh, um, uh, wages down. But we also need to be careful of falling into an idea that we think that it's the unemployed that are causing wages to be low. The, the point is you have no rights in this country because you're not rich. Not because you're South, uh, South African or not South African or unemployed or not. Um, you have no rights in this country because capital is trying to make as much money as possible and because it's finding it harder and harder to keep on expanding profits. You, you have no rights because capital makes its money from exploiting the work of ordinary people instead of organizing production for the things that people need but it organizes production so that Sibanya take, can take its profits to shareholders overseas. And you know, those profits are not being paid out to poor children in the US or, or poor children in, in Europe. They're being paid out to other rich people, you know? So, so I think it's um, uh, the, the capitalist crisis that we have to blame. Um, and the fact that capitalism is a, a system that's organized for making profits for a few instead of for looking after uh, what people need. It's not, it's not about immigrants or people from other countries. Um, sure. Um, okay, uh, we're just gonna hand over the panel. Uh, and then uh, we'll conclude from there. Um, okay, I'm just gonna be very quick and respond to the yeah. question that was asked to me, which maybe connects with the last question as well which is that the, yes, of course, the traditional authority is a big question, right, about what is the role of the king. And I think even now the chieftaincy is in dispute, uh, which also puts this, uh, you know, who's getting royalties and who's actually making decisions about community uh, partnerships, et cetera, into dispute. But also I think that that is part of the whole framework of the migrant labor system and the legacy of homeland. So it's not just, you know, what is the role of the, the king, but the fact is that, you know, how is the king involved is like a better, a, you know, how is that a sustainable idea that is still being upheld? And that goes to the question of, you know, the fact that many of the rock dwellers and mine workers came from the Eastern Cape, and this is a Tswana traditional authority, means something, which means that the traditional authority says, you know, we don't have to build houses for, for this community, and, you know, we don't have to do this because this is particularly defined in, in you know, certain ways. And also, you know, that's one way of looking about at it, and many people want to say that, but at the end of the day, the mine must build for housing for their workers. And this is the point. And this is why it suits mining companies to have traditional authorities as that partner, right? So that it can all just be this, again, back to my point about all this confusing middle layers of representatives and all this stuff, when at the end of the day, they need to pay. They need to pay wages. They need to build houses. And that's just how it has to be, you know? Those are their workers. So just to build on a few things that, um, very quickly, a couple things uh, Kamilta has been suggesting. Um, I think the truth is that um, Sibanya wants to co-opt and control the memory of Americana and eliminate any idea of, of militancy by the people that undermines the, the values of the business that they have. So I heard CEO uh, Fronman saying yesterday at the third annual lecture of Sibanya that this is not philanthropy, this is good business. But as long as the system that Trevor is talking about of racial capitalism remains that relies upon cheap black labor to pull resources 
out of the ground, but then to do virtually nothing to empower the communities that are around the mines or the workers that do the work, we will not be solving the problem. And I just wanted to to just add to what Gabisile, I think, was mentioning that, um, because you're reminding me of something that links to this, which is that they terminate the contracts to destroy the memory of Maracana amongst that generation from 10 years ago. So that soon they hope no one will be left and all we are left to do is heal our trauma without solving the underlying processes of racial capitalism that led to the massacre in the first place. And that Sabanya, if it was put in the same position, may very well have done the same thing 10 years and four days ago. And then uh, one of the students, the socialist students at uh, Witz, he was just mentioning to me that the, the Witz bridge that goes next to the Chamber of Mines, which I think was formerly owned by Anglo, that bridge there, they want to call it, it's going to cost 52 million, and they want to call it Sibanya Stillwater Infinity Bridge. Uh, and they want to start a protest action so that we demand that it's called something like Maracana Memorial Bridge and that they're beginning to, to undertake the actions uh, in the lead up to around October. Uh, so that might be one good practical campaign that comes out of this meeting. <clears throat> Yeah, we should do that, Luke. I support that. So the, the bourgeoisie, they are liars, they are thieves, they are murderers. So it's like that. And then, um, you know, they control governments. Yeah, so we have to vote, you know, because you can influence policy this way, that way. But ultimately, they use their money, their wealth as power to control things. So they control our lives. They decide in this room who will be employed, who will be unemployed. We can all be employed here. Yeah, they decide to close down this factory, and then we finish. <laughs> can you see? Yeah. So the real struggle is to take away that power from them and give it to ordinary people like ourselves. So that's what we are fighting for, for that power to decide. Now, think of those workers on that mountain. They were making the decisions. They were deciding. There was no boss there. They were deciding, we're going to stay another night here. We're going to stay another night here. Tomorrow, we're going to march to the Lonmin Gate. Tomorrow, we're going to march. Can you see? Yeah. So, so in a way, on that mountain, there was a trade union, or a workers' trade union. On that mountain, there was a workers' political party. On that mountain, there was, yes, I agree, a momentary workers' government. If there had been 10 Marikanas happening at the same time in South Africa, it would be a revolution. So, so, the point to think about is that that's why I was talking about, you know, uh, Occupy movement, uh, Egypt, uh, even the Black Spring. You see, because the Black Spring, it ends off, let's vote against Trump and put in Joe Biden, which was a good thing, but it's not taking us forward in a great way. So basically, especially in South Africa, on that mountain, the workers, they tasted their power, okay? They had a taste of the power of workers, but their power was not tested. Because to test that power, we have to take over the state and you have to confront directly the power of capital. So the Occupy Movement, you know, the Black Spring, the Arab Spring, whatever springs, it's just a taste of the power. But the next step, is to test our power by actually saying, no boss rules here. We rule, we decide. That is the future. That's why those workers, they
They could see the future. They were on top of a mountain. Their vision was clear. Yeah. That's why they to be killed. They were trying to kill the spirit of Marikana. But the spirit of Marikana will never die. Because workers, just by being a worker, they've got that organic capacity to resist, fight, and maybe given good strategies to win and overthrow capitalism. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to make one final uh, point, and then we can go for team. We'll reconvene at 3.30. Uh, it's just a very quick point, but I think it's also worth mentioning that these big mining companies are also making money off effectively organized crime. What I mean there? Informal mining, zama zamas, the people in the news. That gold, that coal, those diamonds that come out of these mines, which are mined in dangerous conditions, run by syndicates who are forcing poor migrants and poor workers to go there and die underground with machine guns. That, that, those resources are sold back onto the formal market through backhand mechanisms, and those profits are still being made by the same people. So when we think about this, it's not just some gangs from outside of South Africa, in fact, it's actually the same companies exploiting workers here that are doing this. So we have to bear that in mind. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to everyone for their questions. And we'll reconvene at 3.30. Excuse me?